All right, guys. So just a couple days till archery season in most of these states that you guys are going to go hunt in. So I figured it'd be cool to just do a video on my advice to individuals out there that are going on these over-the-counter hunts, wilderness hunts, remote forest service hunts, hunts where the tag availability is very high and therefore the hunting pressure is very high. So any hunt that you can just go on, go by the tag, or you can maybe draw a zero points or draw what you've been waiting maybe one year, right? Areas where the elk get hunted a bunch. I'm gonna give you the advice that I would give a buddy, an old client, anybody that's been referred to me. I've had this discussion over the last few days several times with folks. I'm gonna give you that exact same advice. The thing about it is I'm doing it completely uncut, completely unedited and without a script. So you're gonna have to bear with me. In my other videos, I cut all that crap out. I cut all my thoughts out, rubbing my face, saying um, that sort of thing. I cut all that out. In this case, I'm not doing that. I don't have the time. I'm literally in eight hours gonna head out to do some of my own hunts and guiding for 40 to 50 days straight. I've got uh, several mountain goat hunts and then I've got a couple weeks of archery elk guiding and then I've got and then I've got a little help on a sheep hunt and then I've also got a personal moose hunt so a lot of my plate so this is going to go out raw so bear with me and tell me if you like this style of video maybe a bunch of you guys will like it but let's jump into the topic here just for the sake of sanity and to put a little pressure on myself I'm going to run a timer here I want this one to stick to 15 minutes or so so I can keep on packing for those hunts I just mentioned. So we've got 15 minutes on the clock here. So when I think about these hunts, these hunts that are tough, right? The reason you have the tag is because it's available and that means it's available to a whole bunch of other people. And the way I would describe this, I think is best with an analogy, right? If you're somebody who's ever had children, before you have your first kid, you, everybody starts to, to hear about it, right? Oh, hey, Cliff, or hey, Jim, I heard you're having your first kid. Awesome, man, it's awesome, it'll change your life. And they, and they say it that way, but nobody ever warns you about the negative components of it, right? And I always thought that it would be useful if somebody would have told me. Somebody would have told me about the sleepless nights. Somebody would have told me about, you know, maybe a few little little you know different mood swings in my wife just thinks about that think think the negative components of it i think there's an analogy there everybody pumps up these hunts and they are awesome like you're going to see spectacular country you're going to do something that 99 plus percent of the people on this earth never get to do and that's that's phenomenal and you're going to get a ton of value out of that but there's going to be these little things that nobody told you about or you haven't fathomed. And the problem is, is if you, if you have to deal with these without warning, it can be crushing to your experience. So those are the first things I wanna talk about. One, if you're coming from, from non-altitude, and for me personally, this is actually a situation for me, I'm, a, I'm about to go guide at high elevation, but I've done it enough times during an acclimation period that I'm prepared for the fact that one, all the symptoms that you hear about, right? Just being out of breath earlier, feeling like you're out of shape, all of that's gonna be very relevant to you. Particularly if you go up there, you get super excited, you're putting in camp in the wilderness, all of that, and you just, and then, you know, you put the whole camp in, and then that night, you and your buddies, or that afternoon, you and your buddies go on a 12 mile hike up at 11,000 feet, burning off all your energy because you're so excited, you wanna scout, you wanna see the area. And the idea is that, you know, just let's get, let's get to it, right? And let's start hunting. A lot of times what happens is you get burned up and you're going to have all the normal altitude uh, symptoms, right? Fatigue, you're not going to want to eat, you're not going to sleep very well. But the thing that people don't talk all right, so of course something's getting screwy with my camera the one time I don't want to have cuts. But anyways, uh, what I was talking about was that the situation with altitude sickness, me personally, even when I don't feel those fatigue systems or those fatigue symptoms, the headache, the altitude stuff that you hear about, a lot of times what you'll feel is you'll feel this intense kind of down. And a lot of times it'll be in the morning. You'll get up after you've been hunting for a couple days and you're in camp, you're all set up, and it could be like the first morning of your hunt, and you're gonna feel 
I mean, I almost like distraught, right? And a lot of times this is accumulation of the symptoms that you've been dealing with, just getting, you know, sleeplessness, not eating enough, that sort of thing. And that's pretty normal. I can tell you that over my years of outfitting, I had to pack a lot of people out in that like second or third day of their trip because they were having this like, you know, almost like this panicky episode. It's like a panic slash depression slash just like helplessness. I think that's the biggest feeling is like a helplessness. Some people feel it is like homesick. You know, they'll want to talk to their family, that sort of thing. It sounds weird even saying it out loud, but I can tell you statistically, it's very common for people to feel this 24 hours, 48 hours in to acclimating to the altitude, to just being away from home, you know, potentially new food. There'll be this like down period. And my biggest piece of advice there is to just power through. Obviously, if you've got like serious altitude sickness or something like that, I'm not saying power through that, but that kind of down or that frantic or like what am I doing here feeling, it can be very strong and I can tell you it's very common for people who are going on this type of hunt. And, and part of it I think is that it, kind of the whole concept of this conversation is I, oh, I gotta start my timer again. I had to pause it while I put the thing on there. But anyway, so I got the timer might be off a little bit. But I think what happens is in this type, this type of conversation uh, uh, goes on it is people don't realize and they haven't imagined the hardships, right? But once you've been there for a couple days, you're starting to deal with conditions that are a little bit off. They're not making you feel all that all that you know perfect you don't feel super energized that sort of thing there can be kind of this down anxiety you know whatever you want to call it helplessness any of that pretty common i tend to know what's coming whenever i go into a camp particularly if i'm dealing with adjustment to altitude so you just have to power through it and that's easier said than done but typically for me you know one night um, you know, eight hours or whatever, my mood will completely shift and I'll get into a groove. So I just look forward to that as a challenge. Like it's going to happen. I'm going to have to go over this, this, you know, this hump and then I can continue to hunt and then I'll be very effective. And it does help. It helps this groove not to be as deep if you try to avoid what I mentioned and that's going out and just getting crazy exhausted the first night you're there. So that's my, that's my first piece of advice. My second piece of advice is particularly when you're archery hunting in these, in these heavily pressured areas, the elk really start to move around a lot. So if you have, you know, the inside scoop from August, you know, the, what the elk were doing in August, or you were there in July or August, and you feel like you have a lot of scouting, you know, info to go off of, just go into your hunt realizing that these elk are going to move. The elk that you saw on August 20th, the bulls that were laying out in the middle of that meadow, they're probably not going to be there. Or if they are, they're probably only going to be there for a short period of time. So this is very relevant if you're going hunting right now. If you're going to go hunt over-the-counter stuff, wilderness stuff in the next five to ten days, the first week of September basically, you need to consider the fact that if you go into your plan of attack, like where you've scouted, where you've seen bulls, go in there. If those elk are in there, keep your shit together and really try to hunt them with, with a timeline, right? Because they're probably going to not be there in five or six days. Almost certainly you're not the only people that know about them. And almost certainly in that group of bulls or cows, they're starting to do their thing now. There's for sure some cows that have been through a bunch of hunting seasons and they're going to pick up on it real quick. All of a sudden they're smelling more they're smelling more people. There's more human scent up there. There's campfires going. They know that and they change up the game. And a lot of times what that means is they'll be there like holy shit. I don't know, my camera keeps dying, so I'm just going to have to keep hitting record. But anyways, you know, everybody says that, hey, this over-the-counter elk hunting is so tough, but I'm in the elk that I scouted. Just keep in mind that you might only have a three to four day period in that, in that moment while those elk are, are there, right? Where you expected them to be. And usually during your hunt, they're going to shift and they're going to disappear. That's very common in the first week of September. There's a couple things they do. They can run the private, but 
the more likely scenario, if you're somewhere fairly remote, is they're going to get into a little hole. And these holes are gonna be similar to what you hear people talk about when they talk about post-rut bull areas, right? An area where the elk don't have to move a whole lot, they've got bedding cover, they've got some feed, they've got some water, and they can rut actually in that area. So a lot of times in these wilderness areas, what you'll see elk shift to is not just the bulls, like the whole unit, the satellite bulls, the herd bulls, the cows, they'll shift into an area that could have an enormous amount of pressure around it, but they're gonna move their running activity, move their vocalizations tonight, and they're gonna really tighten up their pattern and get into a little hole. So you have to keep that in mind. A lot of times they don't move really far off, but they will, they will move to these little holes. So what that means for you, if you're hunting in the next week, but for sure, if you're not gonna start your hunt till the 20th of September or the 25th of September, something like that, you need to consider the fact that go into an area and start hunting, but realize that old sign doesn't matter. And when I say old sign, I mean like three, four day old sign. If you find two day old shit, it's a little mushy, but it's not like steaming green pile of smoking fresh cow, cow, cow crap or bull crap. If it's not that, don't even count it as sign. Same thing with wallows. You can go into a wallow, it can smell like elk, there can be two or three day old sign in there, but I mean, almost in these over-the-counter units, if that wallow is not, you know, dark, like the water's not stirred up, like there was bulls and cows in there this morning or there was, you know, bulls and cows in there last night, if it's not like that, be very wary of that sign. You need to find exactly where those elk are right now. So if you don't already know where they're at, plan on covering some ground, but that doesn't mean just running around the trail system. The worst thing you can do is get on these wilderness trail systems and think that you're hunting. I dealt with this a shit pile of times with hunters over the years, guys that are telling me they're covering five, 10 miles a, you know, miles a day, they're exhausted, they're worn out, they get themselves run down, but they're just on those trail systems. Well, there's pack horses and mules and other hunters on these trail systems for weeks, the elk know they're just like roads, guys. They're just like a road in an area that's got BLM roads all over it and you can drive, drive your pickup on. The, wild, the, the game animals buffer that stuff. So when you have to go on a search for a pocket of elk during archery season, even during rifle season, you need to get off of those trails, right? You need to, you know, go go into the little spots that, that look suspicious that you can glass from a certain angle. Get in there, look at those areas prime time, glass them, look at little water holes that are 500 yards off, you know, off the main trail. There's some old wallows in there. You know, having knowledge of that, you know, marking them all on your onyx, that sort of thing, where you can travel to those strategic spots and find smoking fresh signs. You need to do that. This does not mean just cruising around the cruising around the trails. It'll feel remote to you, but believe me, as a guy who operated in the wilderness, those trails, you know, down the middle of a drainage, down the top of a ridge top that are four or five miles away from any road, 10 miles away from a road, they're not that remote. And the game knows they're there. You have to get off of those and find the little nooks, find the spots you can glass, find those. Find those game trail crossings where you can look for fresh sign. Find that. Once you find smoking fresh sign in these areas, the elk are probably going to be there until you screw them up. And that's a key thing for you to keep in mind. It's very likely, you know, after the second or third week, these elk have been hunted a lot. So they're in that spot for a reason. So be meticulous how you hunt it every time you leave the tent. Think about the wind. Think about what the prevailing it, prevailing wind is. Think about what the thermal is going to do during the day. Because believe me, these little holes. If you find, you know, some, you know, some little hidden hidden chunk in the timber, you know, a lot of time, a lot of times, it's a face that's like where nobody else can glass it. It can be a heavily hunted. Oh, my camera is driving me crazy. 
but sometimes a lot of times it's a finger ridge or a face that nobody else can glass in the area right so you've you've found it in those elk are in there but they feel very secure it's probably a historical spot the worst thing you can do is go in there and hunt it with a bad thermal get above it first thing in the morning blow scent down in there those elk are boom gone because they were there they were in their plan c d spot now they're going to go to their plan d e f spot right they know what's up so you, when you find these little pockets be very careful how you hunt them the plus side of it is they're in those pockets for a reason so you probably have time it's probably going to be a while before other elk hunters find those elk or if there are elk hunters on them a lot of times those guys that are hunting those little pockets they know exactly what they've got too and a lot of them have historical knowledge right like they know that pocket and they're going to do their best not to screw it up and in those situations this is one situation where I have seen guys that would naturally be very competitive. I've seen these kind of guys work together. I've done it as an outfitter or guiding myself and I've run into do-it-yourself hunters that know the same pocket. Like, hey, we know there's some elk in here. Do-it-yourself hunters to do-it-yourself hunters. Same thing. We know some elk in here. Have the conversation. Like, they know you have, they know they're in there. They can give you some insight on, hey guys, like, let's not, let's not fuck this up, okay? Like, let's figure it out where we both have a chance. Sometimes that does work, and a lot of times it works because you both have the information that the elk are in that pocket. So on the strategy end, that would, that's what I would say, particularly here in the archery season, focus on. Find those little pockets if you're not straight into elk. All right, guys, the thing is giving me a heat warning, so I got to pause it. There's going to be a cut here. Okay. Sorry, guys crazy like i haven't having this issue with this camera so if anybody out there has got a recommendation over a zv1 that's what i record with a sony zv1 if you have a new camera recommendation let me know mine seems to be shitting out overheating all the time or something anyways i'll uh uh let's go here so i got my timer back going we've got three minutes left here all right so covered some general topics on strategy i want i do want to cover calling the first thing I'll say on calling is that if you guys are hunting these heavily pressured elk, you have to take everything you have seen out there on videos, 80% of the stuff you see on YouTube uh, when it comes to calling an elk, you have to take that stuff with a grain of salt. You're in a whole different ball game. And there's a couple of huge factors in that. One, just the pressure on the elk. The elk are going to be you know more careful about vocalizations you know you always hear you always hear this let me this stupid thing all right you always hear this but areas where wolves go in right people they you know people will always say this areas in idaho where wolves were introduced or wolves moved in the the elk shut up right they can't they pull back their vocalizations a bunch the same thing's gonna go on when there's this massive influx of human predators right you're gonna have the fact that the elk know, what are, know what's going on. I personally think that it's not that they completely shut their vocalizations down. I just think that they overall move a lot of their activity to being nocturnal. So a lot of their vocalizations are going on at night, but they do probably quiet down a bit. The other big one is that there's way less of them. And that's just a fact, particularly bull density. Bull density in these areas in Colorado is way lower than other areas. It is like you know, multiple folds lower than the density of bulls in your standard Arizona unit or your standard New Mexico unit, particularly the units that take quite a few points to draw. That bull density, if you talk to anybody who raises elk commercially, they will tell you that the key, the very, the key variable by far on, on elk vocalizations, bugling, cow calling, all of that is density of animals. And specifically they will say, if you get a bunch of bulls in one area on a group of cows, bugling goes way up. Has, it, has, it has less to do with one of those cows being in estrus than people think and a whole lot more to do with the fact that the bull density is high. So 
you have those factors working against you in these sort of areas. The, the bull density is not there. So you're not going to have as many vocalizations. So keep that in mind. I mean, it, it could be very hard to locate a bull with, with bugles in these type of areas. That would just be one forewarning that I would give you when you're looking at a lot of the material out there, a lot of the material out there where that's the primary way people locate elk. Just be wary that that tactic may not be as effective in a place like Colorado that's wide open and the elk are, are way less dense in terms of bulls. And the other component of that is just realize that elk, the, the elk are just warier. So they're, we're going we're gonna to keep rocking. I'm blaming it on my, my camera screw ups. But anyways, um, we're going to talk two or three more minutes here because I got some good shit for you guys to leave you with. But what I was going to say on the calling front, think about it. Think about it like this. These elk have a heightened sense of smell and they have a heightened sense of sight, right? Just being warier. And that goes for the cows and the bulls in these heavily hunted areas. So again, you have to take it for granted or you have to take it with a grain of salt when you see guys calling an elk from 800 yards, 1,000 yards, and they're in these huge rut fests and they're able to pull these you know, these 360 inch satellite bulls off of these rut fests and then they stick them with an arrow. The chances of you doing that are literally, they're close to zero, guys, if you're hunting this type of stuff. So consider what you're much more likely to be able to do is to get a bull to come your way a little bit or to get a bull who's within, you know, he could be within 70 yards from you, but your goal should be to get him in a position to kill with your bow. It shouldn't be to convince him to do something that's astronomically different than the plan he has ahead of himself, right? So if you get up in the morning, you find some elk, you've located them over the days, you use the thoughts I already talked about, you've located a pocket of elk, and you've got them bugling in the timber, or they're, or they're, you've got them bugling in the aspens, let's say. They've been feeding on the edge of the aspens, and now they're moving through the aspens. You, you can see them moving, and they're with, they're with their cows, and you know they're going to this dark timber, this little hell hole that you've been watching them in, and you saw the sign in. So, don't go get perpendicular to that. Get your wind perfect and try to call them 800 yards to you down, you know, down into a hole and then up, right? You're not going to get one of these over-the-counter bulls to do that typically. What you need to do is factor in your wind, but go over there and get between those elk where they're at now and their destination and then have the mindset of my setup on these elk, my call-in setup is just to get them you know, pushed over here, nudged over here a little bit and get them in a position where I can ethically whack them with my bow. That's your goal. You can't get in this mind. You're not going to puppet string these over the counter bulls. They're too smart. And the primary reason is that one, the, it, it, there's, you can dig into this deep, but believe me, I, I'll, I'll just give you example. I've, I've guided in over the counter wilderness stuff, the stuff that a lot of you guys are going to hunt. And I've guided on on elk ranch you know ranches that their primary focus is raising big elk and hunting big elk you know these these hunts that cost you know what my truck costs right those type of hunts those elk there it could be a 350 inch bull and believe me you can get them cranked up and they can come through let's say aspens right pretty low cover right they can see pretty damn far in the aspens usually it's pretty sparse there's grass going on there's not a big canopy that keeps it dark they can see a lot right believe me they pop into those aspens those big you know trophy ranch bulls they're not near as wary like a 350 inch bull could just kind of be chilling you know he's just cruising moseying through like he's gonna go find a cow he hears a cow over there he's or some bull over there you know some piss ant bull has pissed him off he's gonna go whip his ass he's kind of chilling when an over-the-counter bull, even if he's two and a half, three and a half years old, he drops down in there, particularly if he's got a couple old cows with him that have been living in the wilderness for 10, 12 years, he drops into some like some open aspens and you're over there calling against a tree or a little bush or whatever. He drops in there, he's looking for that cow and he knows exactly where you're at. He's heard you call, he knows exactly where you're at. And believe me, when he hits that open country where he should have line of sight, he's gonna be like, boom, where are you? 
Where are you now? We're not gonna, this isn't debatable. I'm not gonna kind of think about it. I ain't moving until I know where you're at and I see a cow. So you have to consider that in your call setups because, and that's, that's what factors in here, guys, is that if you're trying to get where you're manipulating these elk from long way, a long ways and getting them to do what you, what you wanna do, even if they start to come to you, even if you get lucky on that front, the problem is, is somewhere along there, they're gonna think that they should have line of sight to you. And it, particularly in Colorado, because a lot of the country's more open than Idaho, Oregon, Washington, that kind of stuff, that's kind of a different ball game. But in Colorado, parts of Wyoming, when these elk come from a distance and they start looking, I mean, I've seen bulls look across a canyon, I mean like 800 yards away, and they're looking in thick aspens, maybe even a timber edge where some, some hunter's calling, and they're just like, boom, looking at them. They don't see a cow, and they, do, they no longer give a shit about that situation. Boom, they're back on track to what they were planning on doing. So you have to factor that strategy in when calling. You gotta, you know, you're not gonna get a ton out of these elk. And the last thing I'll say on that is that there's a cost to calling elk that a lot of people don't wanna talk about, and that cost is very high in these kind of over-the-counter situations. Had to edit there because my freaking camera died. But anyways, the cost is high in these situations for over-the-counter stuff because what happens, Just I just talked about it, but just to dig deeper, those elk, when you call to them, they know your location. They don't know the general location. They don't know the hillside. They know the tree. They know the tree. They know the service berry bush that you're standing next to. And they have pinpointed that in their mind. They, the, the, analogy, or the term I like to use is elk see, or no, yeah, elk see with their ears in, in, the, in the idea of how we see as humans, right? We know the exact spot, right? The elk are the same way with their hearing when you're calling, they know the exact spot. So you've given one of your cards to the elk, right? They know where they should see a cow, where they should be suspicious, right? So that's handing them a card in this over-the-counter stuff. If the situation arises where it's gonna be very difficult for you to get in a situation where you only need to, you only need to get that elk to move, you know, 50 yards, 100 yards, if that situation's not there, and this is going a lot of times this is the case. It could be this, the movement of the elk, how fast they're going, you know, where they're at in relation to you, all of that stuff, the wind, all that stuff is factoring in. You may not be able to get in there and do a setup where you're just pushing the elk a little bit to your will, right? You're gonna need to do more than that. If you need to do more than that, it looks like you're gonna have to call the bull 150 yards, 200 yards, or you're gonna have to get him to do something crazy, right? Like call him uphill to you. Bulls hate that shit. All bulls do. Even, even you know, bulls that get hunted for one day a year, they still hate that because that's inherent to their being, right? They don't wanna come up into another bull that's gonna whip their ass. So you're asking a lot out of that elk. So if that is the case, with these over-the-counter elk, realize that if you booger them up in that situation, that's probably your chance. They're bumping off. They went, now they're going from plan D to plan E, right? And that means two or three days of your time maybe to relocate them. But anyways, realize that that's the case and make a decision on that. There's a lot of times on these type of hunts that spot and stock in those bulls is way smarter, period. It's not as much fun. I, I know, guys, it's not as much fun. It's not what you dreamed of. It's not the bull, you, you know, lip balling in your face as you frontal shoot him perfectly and the blood squirts out all over the place and he head, head plants in front of you and rolls over so you can gut him. It may not be that dream, but spot and stock does work and consider that. You know, just examples there or like the bull, you know, might be going to bed and he might bed right on that timber. He might bed where there's a little rim rock and you can you can stock up in there and shoot him in your bed that's cool that works the other thing is he might bed somewhere it gives you time to work the wind and now get in position so when he gets up out of that bed and goes to the wallow he's been working or going back out to feed where he was the, the night before you can you can whack him with your bow so there's opportunity there don't discount that 
So guys, I hope that's so guys, I hope that's useful to you. Like I said, this is the exact same advice I would give anybody, a friend, an old client, you know, somebody that was just you know, gave somebody my phone number. That's what I would tell you is consider that stuff. The last thought I'll leave you with is have your own expectations. In these really, these really heavily hunted elk guys, a cow is a trophy, a raghorn bull is a trophy, any elk that's legal and you're happy with and, and you enjoy the hunt, that's a trophy. And the experience is a trophy. Most of you are not gonna kill anything. Most of you statistically are not going to draw your bow and the people that in in the individuals that do draw their bow and, and then that subset that does shoot at a bull or a cow, a good chunk of you are going to spend a bunch of time out there tracking that animal and unfortunately aren't going to find it. Those are realities that you have to deal with. Those are just the statistics. So keep that in mind. Don't judge yourself against what you see in social media. Social media when it comes to elk hunting is total bullshit. It's total bullshit. Some of, think about, look, go look at my Instagram, right? Or go look at historical pictures of me from 5, 10, 20 years. You don't know. Some of those elk are hard-earned, you know, wilderness elk. Some of those elk are from ranches that the, the hunting is spectacular and it costs a bunch of money or it's a very hard tag to draw. You don't know that from an observer. So don't judge yourself against what you see out there in, Insta, in Instagram or other social media. That, that's, that's horrible. It, it, it'll, the thing about it is it, what that does is it makes it so you judge your experience against that and that doesn't make sense and i'm not saying this from this i love hunting huge bulls if if you're out in these areas and on these tough hunts and you kill a monster old bull power to you man if you're even if you're going on a a, a ranch hunt where you know it's it's crazy expensive hunt crazy hard draw to or tag to draw whatever and you kill a monster bull awesome i love doing that that's my whole goal in life is just to be in rut fests hunt you know hunting 380 inch bulls that would be awesome but don't you know particularly if you're hunting these hunts that are really hard don't compare yourself to that it's not fair to you and it's going to take away from your experience the number one the number one factor statistically on big antlers on bulls that guys kill the, the number one statistical factor is how much they paid for the access and the tag or how many points they had or how lucky they are to get the tag, right? That's just a statistical fact. Not taking away anything from anybody that kills big bulls on ranches or draw tags or whatever. But if you're doing this type of hunt, the you know, the the over-the-counter, easy to draw tag, don't let that fact screw up your hunt and screw up your mind. You'll have way more fun and realize that you're hunting elk how a lot of people will never get a hunt and you're experience the country in a way that almost nobody gets to hunt out there. It's to, I have so much nostalgia for it and I know the pain. It sucks. Some of these hunt, like parts of these hunts suck. Even whole hunts can suck given the variables that you are dealt. But it's like, it's the way to hunt elk. It's the hardcore way to hunt elk. And you get to experience that. I have no long how I have no idea how much longer that is going to be practical in this country. I hope for generations, but I have a feeling that we're hunting these wilderness areas, these over-the-counter areas, even though the hunting has got astronomically harder over the last decade. I still feel like we're in the good old days. So go out and go out there and enjoy it. And I hope this has been helpful to you. There's a few edits in it because my freaking camera, but I pretty much gave it to you straight. Hope it was helpful. If you guys liked it, I always say that. If you guys liked it, like the video. I'm gonna mix it up, okay? That's how I try to do this. If you guys enjoyed this or found it useful, like the video, subscribe to the channel. I have a bunch more out. I'm gonna be out of pocket for the next 45 days, but I'll do my best to get content out there. Shoot a bunch of elk guys. Send them to me, DM, to, DM me on Instagram, email me, whatever. I love when you guys tell me those stories. I love it when you tell me that, you know, something I said was right and it was helpful to you. If you did something completely opposite of what I recommend and it was helpful to you, same shit. Send me the picture. I love it. Good luck out there, guys. I'll talk to you later.